Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, um, good post-mortem or bad post-mortem to you if you are watching this. This is the same old Arsenal podcast, the therapy edition. It's me, Chris, Suburban Gunnar uh, on Twitter and other places that you can find me, Instagram, all of that sort of rubbish nonsense threads. Uh, and today's session will be a lamenting session because we will be lamenting the... Uh, shambles that was yesterday's second half performance and i'm specifically referencing the second half performance because i think that's where we kind of lost it because i think most of us at half time and we will come to this but most of us at half time were pretty okay but that second half was where it all went wrong and potentially could be season defining it's the the trio of us this evening there is to my left amanda good girl 1969 how are you doing um deflated, disappointed, but nice to be talking with you all. Yes, and the uh, fabulous uh, James Cook, uh, Cookie, J.E. Cooks 96. How are you doing, mate? You all right? Not so fabulous this evening, mate, but I'm sure, as Amanda says, speaking to you wonderful people will poke me up. <laughs> yeah, and speak to us in the chat as well. So if you've got any questions, you can put them in the chat, have a little conversation amongst yourselves ask us any questions uh discuss with us what you are doing as your own catharsis and your own attempt at getting over the defeat that was 2-0 versus Aston Villa yesterday and before we go into the whys and wherefores of that of course we are sponsored by the fabulous Ruth Beck Art and she is often sending us some amazing uh, things that she does and you can visit her shop on Etsy so I would encourage recommend and implore you to go and check out Ruth Beck Art because she does great stuff. Karen, evening in the chat. Um, okay, let's do this then. Let's all give ourselves a, a little reflection time. Um, and Amanda, before we do that, obviously pre-game, we all watched Liverpool and thought to ourselves, lovely jubbly, and we just need to do our job now. And we do our job and we go clear of Liverpool and we go clear of City and the title is in our hands and we are feeling good. You met a few people beforehand. Were they all, do you want to give them a shout out and were they all as buoyant as uh, you expected? Yes, I did actually. I watched the game with them on Concourse 11. I was on with Simon Lester, Amy, Albert turned up and we were all buoyant. Everyone was going mad, you know, like every time Liverpool like went down their end and nothing happened, we were all cheering and Crystal Palace and it was just great, wasn't it? And we were all so buoyant. So big up to all those and also all the people outside that, you know, few people came up to me and said they really enjoy our podcast, which is so lovely to hear. It seemed like a lot of people were very buoyant yesterday. Big happy birthday to Emerson, who is 56 tomorrow, another one of our regulars. And it was all just such a lovely, you know, start to the game. You know, I did not expect Liverpool to go to Crystal Palace. Sorry, was it Palace at Anfield? I can't remember which way it was. Yeah, it was Palace but at to Anfield. Win, yeah, to, to, I didn't even give them a chance. So I just kept thinking... We just win every game. That's what we've got to do. And everyone was buoyant. Everyone. And I, I did not have a negative moment bone in my body. Simon Lester put um, take that Merseyside or something. And I was like, this is all just great. You know, we're all having fun. And then we mm. started the game. <laughs> um, mm. And I'm sure you go into it. But it was lovely to meet everybody and all the viewers of uh, Same Old Arsenal podcast. Um, it was so nice that you really appreciate everything we do. And we love speaking with you too. Yeah, we certainly do. Cookie, how are you feeling before the game? And then let's delve into, you know, one hour before kickoff, team news gets announced. Uh, Arteta goes with a few changes. So we had a uh, back four, which you'd expect. Um, Zinchenko, Gabriel, uh, Saliba and uh, Ben White. Then you've got Declan Rice playing in a more familiar number six because we've seen a bit of Jorginho lately. But of course, it was um, get Declan Rice in at the six and then left eight Havertz, right eight Martin Odegaard with Trossard, Gabriel Jesus and Saka. Can you give me some how you're feeling beforehand thoughts? And then also um, lineup thoughts because I will admit right now, yes, it was changes, and in hindsight, maybe not the best changes. But I looked at that and thought, I'm happy with that. A little bit of rotation, good players, 
Trossard in form, Gabriel Jesus doing well. It was all right. What did you think? So pre-match, having watched the Liverpool game, I have to say that actually made me a little bit more apprehensive going into the match. Obviously, don't get me wrong. At the time, I was delighted that Liverpool had lost their game. Palace had done the job. But part of me did wonder how that would impact us. And I'm not saying that that had any waiting on the game yesterday. I don't think yesterday was necessarily a mental thing. I think it was a combination of tactics, players running on their last breath. And I'm sure we'll go into speaking about that second half performance later on in the podcast. But going into the game, yeah, I was a little bit cautious, erring on the side of caution. And like you, I didn't really have any problems with the team lineup. I mean, we've got to rotate and we have to rotate sensibly. We've just played a massive game against Bayern Munich. We've got an enormous game coming up against them. Uh, in the Champions League. And you could already see that the players that are being rotated in were starting to run on empty in yesterday's game anyway, the way this squad is being utilised. So didn't have any problems with the team. Um, I thought it was interesting that we saw Jesus start at nine because we've not seen him there in a long time. I mean, we've been on this fantastic run with Havertz leading the line. And even before it was Havertz, it was Trossard. So it's been an awful long time since Gabby Jesus has actually started a game as an out-and-out -out nine for us. Um, but that's where he did so well for us last season. I was a little bit hesitant about Havertz reverting back into the midfield because I've never truly been convinced by him there. I don't think it, it necessarily gets the best out of him. For me, he is now an out-and-out -out striker or should be playing in some way, shape or form across that forward line. And I really like the balance that we've got with Jorginho, Declan Rice or you know having the options at Partey and Declan Rice. So I was a bit unsure about that. But I could understand when the team went out there and started playing you could see those runs from deep that Havertz was making. And Villa, I think you could see in that first half, evidently couldn't deal with those runs from deep. It was happening time and time and time again. There were a lot of offsides there, but we were getting in a lot of space in behind. And that was predominantly coming through Kai Havertz. So you can understand it. I don't think this is down to team selection. I think there are certain players that, as someone says, Karen Russell says in the chat room, do I prefer Trossard as an impact sub or to start the games? I think he's a prime example of someone that should come off the bench. Oh. I think Jesus is making that point as well, um, given how he played against Bayern Munich coming off the bench. Um, I, yeah, happy with the team lineup, happy with the first half performance, not happy with how it panned out. No, me neither, mate, me neither. But do you know what? It's interesting you say that about Havertz in a left eight, because my view is kind of like, does it matter too much? It probably does, um, but... He sort of plays in similar sort of positions, only just slightly deeper, I think. And what I thought at first, certainly after that first half, was that it was a good move from Arteta because he was making those runs and getting in behind again and again and again in the first half. He was getting in. You're shaking your head, Amanda, so please feel free to jump in in a second. But I saw Kai Havertz get in behind a few times. Times. And I thought to myself, if he gets the, if he does the same stuff like that in the second half, which he didn't, admittedly, but the whole team didn't perform, then we're in, we're in here because it looked like it was a move that seemed sensible enough. It just wasn't being executed. But you were shaking your head up there, Amanda. So disagree with me. Yes. We get accused of not. We get accused of agreeing with each other too much. <laughs> so come at me. I don't know why he's changed it, and I'm with. Our lovely friend Craig, who's in the chat room. Why change Havertz? Scored more goals, won more games with him up front. Craig, I was just about to say it before you put your post, uh, before you put your comment up. Um, why change it? Why? Jesus, no. You leave Havertz up front. I, I didn't understand that. And then Jorginho should be playing. And I understand we've got rotate. I understand. And we could see they, you know, they were tired in the second half. But why are you changing it? And Zinchenko. Uh, 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 just play Kivio, please. Just it, it's just got to stop. It, it, it's got to stop. Uh, I just can't. I can't deal with Zinchenko. And Jesus has lost pace. And so now he's lost pay, his pace. There's no point in having him on the pitch, if I'm honest. Um, and you know, I'm sorry. I disagree with you, you both. I sort of disagreed with you, Cookie, and then you went into what I was saying. I, I wanted Havertz where he was. Why are you changing him? I thought we had a terrible game, Havertz, yesterday. And for me, it wasn't even his fault. I, I just don't understand why we've changed it. And that's where I will disagree with you on, on that. Because Havertz had a game like he did at the very beginning of the season. That's how he looked. And, and he's been absolutely brilliant. And 
honestly, I mean, you could, I'm not here to, I've never been one of those that slags off players or anything, but Zinchenko makes my blood pressure rise. Um, and Havertz up front, Jesus is not doing it, unfortunately. And I 100% agree that Trossard is an impact sub and shouldn't be starting. And I think this all started to go slightly wrong when Martinelli got injured and didn't come back. And I think that's it. we've lost a bit. Saka looks like he's definitely carrying something. Um, even Declan Rice didn't do great yesterday. I mean, when have we ever said that? But um, why? And I, I, I play Tommy Esso. I'd rather him start with him. I really would. But anyway. I could go on about all of them. So a couple of bit, couple of bit, couple of bits there. I think we will get to Zinchenko. Um, we played Brighton last week, and it was a very similar side, and there wasn't really mm. a, a problem there. So I do think we're we're all quite emotional and reacting to the stresses and the probably disappointment of what happened yesterday. But um, and we will come to Zinchenko because he played a, such a big negative part in the goals that we ultimately were well, first certainly the first goal that we conceded um but if we look at that first half in isolation um we created some decent chances yes villa had a mm. shot which hit the inside of the post which with ollie watkins but that was very much a countered sort of thing and i didn't think they offered that much threat let's let's talk about some positives which was martin Erdegaard uh, was very very good yesterday in the first yeah. half i thought and if you think about that first half as as a whole, you've got Havertz hit the side netting. Martin has made a good save from Havertz. Um, Bukayo Saka That's hit the other cool. side netting. Tr the Trossard one is the one that was giving me nightmares because because uh, I'm 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 lower tier and right up the other end by the North Bank. You don't see it as well, uh, and so it just looked like an amazing Martinez save. But when you watch it in the replay, James, I mean, he's got to stick that away, hasn't he, Trossard? Yeah, I mean, he got the placement absolutely perfect for his goal in midweek. He gets by Munich, but this one he just got completely wrong. And, you know, the ball is coming in, into him at such at such pace, he might not have time to even think about where he's going to put it. And that's the one saving grace I'm going to give him. But, I mean, when you're that close to the goal, you've got to be burying that. You've got to. And if we score that, I'm not saying we go on to win this comfortably, you know, Based on that second half, we might have run out of gas, but maybe we'd have made some substitutions. I don't know. You know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, and we're never going to know what would have happened had that ball hit the back of the net. But I think our first half performance deserved the goal. I think we were we were good value for a goal. We had all those opportunities. Mm -hmm. The sack of chance went just wide of the post. Havertz was getting in time and time and time again. But the problem is, we never started the second half like we we played for the majority of that first half. And Unai Emery reacted. To the problems that he was having in that midfield. I mean, McGinn and Tielemans were, were outstanding in midfield for them yesterday. They were absolutely outstanding. They didn't let us have a sniff in that second half, completely outdid us in there. And um, yeah, we just couldn't cope with it. We just couldn't live with it. And we just couldn't couldn't break them down in that second half. And it's, it's interesting because I, I don't really remember Emery reacting in that sort of way when he was with us. And I definitely think his pedigree as a manager is certainly going up a level. But um, it was disappointing that we things, he? he has he definitely has and it was disappointing that we couldn't we couldn't muster anything up. But no, in that second half we were we, we were totally outplayed, weren't we? If we're being honest, Villa deserved two goals and more, arguably, because we just we just didn't show up. No, and, but uh, just just to, just finalise, we will go into the second half in a sec. But just finalise on the on the first half, the dominance, just to hit home some dominance and why, like you say, the sliding doors moment. If we go, I think this is a game where if we go one nil up, this is like the Luton game, which we win two nil. You know, it's relatively comfortable. Villa sort of sit back and think, well, we're playing Europe in midweek, and so let's just take off a few players. Let's not risk anything, and he just gives up. But first half, our expected goals one point four five, and we we didn't bag it. Uh, we didn't bag anything. Um, Fifty six percent possession to Villa's forty four. Uh, we had fourteen attempts on goal in that first half. In the whole match, we had eighteen attempts on goal, and I think this really is the story of that first half. It, it is it is this sorry the story of the game is the difference between the two sides. Villa had their amazing second half. We had a good first half, but Villa took away their chances. And I felt, Amanda, it was a bit like deja vu, like at Villa Park, because we had plenty of chances at Villa Park. I remember Martin Erdegaard being, I think it was just on the six-yard box, and Emmy Martinez made what you thought in real time was an amazing save, but the reality is, is he put it pr pretty much down his throat. We had lots of chances at Villa Park. We opened them up, and so after at half-time, I was chatting to a few of the lads in the concourse. 
over a beer and I've, uh, we were all sort of relatively calm. Um, how were you feeling at that half time point? Were you calm as well? I was a little bit because they hit the post, didn't they, down our end? And I was like, oh, you know, that went in the post across the line and out. And I was like, mm, bit of luck. Don't take your chances. You don't win games, as my father says. And I was like, maybe someone's looking out for us. And then they did it again in the second half. They hit the post. I wasn't panicking, but I was surprised that we didn't put one chance away. And it started to concern me mm. just a little bit because I'm thinking, Liverpool have lost here. City are top. We can't have this in City's hands. It's got to be in ours. We've got to keep it in ours. So I was getting a little bit of pressure, but I wasn't to the point where I was when I left at full time. That was, I was totally different then. Um, but I always, you know me, and I get accused of this, I'm always quite positive and I always try and err on the side of positivity. But I said to Carl, I bet this is nil-nil today. I don't even, I, I just don't think we're going to score. We just didn't look great in the first half. We looked all right. I'm not saying that. But I didn't find Villa bad. You know, we've got to say that Villa were a good side. They're fourth. You know, they're, they're not bad. A bit, you know, table doesn't lie. Um, the only table lies is that Tottenham are fifth and they should be like 15th. But I'm just saying with Villa, I thought they played all right first half. And the problem is when Emery comes, Emery just wants to beat us constantly. Now, everyone's going, oh, when he went to City, you know, uh, he just laid down and died. He had his B team out. It was a bit different, but he just wants to beat us. And so does Martinez. And I'm sorry, what anyone says about Martinez, he's such a good goalkeeper that to beat him, we have got to be how we were a month ago, and we're not. And every time he made a save, Chris, I was concerned. I was like, are we going to score today? Yeah. So for me, do you know what's really interesting is for before the game, I was quite quietly confident because of the way that we've been playing. And that brought, before the Brighton game, I was yeah. really, really nervous. I thought to myself, yeah. this is a game where I can just see us slipping up in, you know, this is the sort of match which would be difficult. And we just put Brighton to the sword. And that made me think for the first time, hold on, there's something going on here. And then you had the, the situation with the Bayern result where, again, we started off brilliantly. And I thought, this team's got it. This team's got the minerals. And yeah. we had, James, some uncharacteristic defensive errors in midweek. And we had uncharacteristic defensive errors again this weekend and for a team that we were reeling off the clean sheets uh, over the last couple of months we've barely been conceding any chances or any goals you know four goals in two games could wreck our season couldn't it well my worry chris is that this the, the these results the one against bayern munich and the one yesterday they get a bit compounded and i really do worry that we could see it happen again you know against Bayern Munich and then again against Wolves like these are not two easy games and like you I felt like the Brighton one could have been one where we could have potentially slipped up in I never ever envisaged that we would keep them at arm's length in the way that we did I can't even remember an opportunity that they had in the game we were so good that day I think we just need to remember who we are because that was a week ago literally a week ago we, we are such a good football team still we've still got a lot of credit in the bank, hell of a lot of credit, but we just can't let a couple of poor results. I mean, the Bayern Munich one, you don't even have to look at that as a poor result. We've, we've got a great opportunity to get through to the semi-finals of the Champions League for the first time in God knows how long on Wednesday. The mood could feel very different if we go through on Wednesday night and beat Wolves. So we just don't want to let these results define us because we did it earlier on in the season. We lost to West Ham in a game where it was very similar to this one. We played well for a good portion of it. The other team defended well, took their chances, were clinical. We then followed that up with a dire performance against Fulham. And we then lost to Liverpool in the FA Cup. We cannot have that happen again in mid-April with just over a month of the season left. If we do, it's curtains. It, and, and I worry yeah. about what will happen if we go out of the Champions League, going into the Wolves game, and then don't win that. Because then people will definitely be saying... It's over. I mean, my personal opinion, I think if we drop any more points anywhere, the league is done. I, I think whilst we're you know, two points behind City, then you've, you're an idiot to be saying that it's done. But I think we're very much ingrained in the mindset of, well, City just don't slip up at this point in the season. But you look at their games, they're, they're not the most straightforward. They've got games coming up that they dropped points in last season. So all is not lost. 
but we've got to beat mm. the teams that are coming up. And, you know, United away, Spurs away, they were the ones that I was looking at and thinking maybe that they're the ones where we can allow for a little bit of room for error. But on paper, Villa are the best team we're going to face in this running. And if you look at United and Spurs, if we don't beat them, OK, it's away from home. But if we don't beat them, I don't think we deserve to win this league. So for me, I just want us to win these next six games. If we, you know, lose the league by two points, I can live with that because to have lost just one game this year, to have won all the others and drawn the other one against the best team in world football. And we're talking about, because of that, our season is hanging by a thread. That's just mental. We've lost one game this mm. year and suddenly everything's falling apart. It just shows you the level that you need to be at. And I think the team is allowed an off day, but when you're coming up against City, you just can't afford to drop any points. But like I say, all is not lost. There's two points in it. Get through on Wednesday, win against Wolves. We're in a fantastic place again. I mean, look at it this way. I'll end yeah. on this one. Let's say we were five points behind City. They lost at the weekend in a in a parallel universe and we won and we go two points behind them with six games to go. We'd all be buzzing. But because it's it's not working out that way, and I know context is a wonderful thing, in the context mm. of it, it doesn't feel great. But let's say that was the context. If we were two points behind with six games to go, I think a lot of us would have taken that at the start of the season. Surely we would have. I definitely would have. Yeah. So... I do want to come back to the Villa game and the goals. We need to talk about the second half and the performance. I want to talk about the fatigue. I want to talk about the goals. But I just want to stay on this, given that it's the natural flow of the conversation. So I'm going to stick with you, Cook, just for a second. And then, Amanda, if I can, because it's, re it's re related to what Cookie's talking about here. Do you believe, James, that we can go the next six? I'm just talking the league now. Let's park the buy-in stuff. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Do you believe that we can go and win every single one of our next six games? It's not a straightforward answer because I think a lot of it hinges on Wednesday. If we don't go through on Wednesday or if we play badly and we go out, then I think that's going to have a negative impact going into the Wolves game. I really do. And I think the mental fatigue of that will be a big problem. And if you look back to last year when we crumbled, you know, we lost against City. That was compounded by defeats against the likes of Brighton, Forest. Um, and we, you know, just fell apart in those closing stages of the season. You know, we've got all our players back now, pretty much. So there's no real excuse to to not be giving it our all in these games. I know fatigue's staying in, but you know, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be tired when you look at how Villa played. I, I still think if we can rotate sensibly and if we can get the best out of these players, then you're not going to see too many performances like we saw in the second half yesterday. Do I think we can win these next six games? Yes, I do. I really do. Whether we will or not is another thing, but sometimes you need a defeat like this to to allow you to reset and go again and focus on winning those last six games. Um, easier said than done because now we've got a psychological challenge as well as a, a physical one. But, you know, you were saying it all season long, Amanda, you'd rather be in the chasing pack. So maybe we're, we're in a better place now. Yeah. However, Amanda, <laughs> I... I, I, and it's weird because you sound like me, Cooks, and I'm just about to sound like you. As soon as I left yesterday, I said it was over. I said City are not going to lose a game. They're not going to drop a point. They don't. OK, so and I'm still feeling like that. I, I, I think I think it's done, Cooks. They don't lose games at this part of the season. And I think our confidence has been we weren't great against Luton. We drew against Bayern when everyone was saying Bayern were the worst team in the German league or whatever, you know, they're terrible, which I didn't find them that bad. Um, and then we lost yesterday. To come back from that, to go to Bayern on Wednesday night, of course you've got to have hope. Listen. I think you're being very harsh there. I know, I know. And I sound like normal fans, but normally I'm the positive one like, oh, it's not over to the fat lady. Season. Sounds like me. Yeah, I say, I, I, but I truly believe that, and it's not. And thank God we didn't podcast last night. I'd probably be banned from podcasting. I was so angry, and and when I put it into perspective, one game, Premier League game, in the whole of twenty four, of course. But when you when you watch what's happened, and it's so upsetting that they couldn't even play well in the second half, not even come out and look up for it. Why are they not looking up for it? Why are we making mistakes? What's going on? What happened in that second half? You know, I don't agree with his substitutions. I don't under, I mean, obviously at the time we didn't know Erdegaard was carrying a knock. Can't believe he was because he was he was our best player. But for me, and I think I'm so used to watching City do this, I can't see him dropping a whole game 
I can't see it losing a draw, maybe. I don't know, but I cannot see them losing anything. Um, and I can't see us winning the next six games where two months ago I predicted we'd win five games and we did. So I'm just not, uh, I, I don't know. I thought maybe today I'd feel a bit more positive. I don't feel like that, Cooks. However, I've loved the season and we and it's a funny old game. And I will just go back to 1989. We lost to Derby 2-1. Liverpool were the city of those days. That's it. No one beat Liverpool. And I went on radio and had a tantrum because I was 18. Exactly how I felt yesterday when I went, that's it. It's all over. You might as well give the league to Liverpool. And obviously, what do I know? So I do have that little bit there thinking, and I did tweet this after I was quite upset. I said, it'd be so Arsenal to go to the Allianz and beat Bayern. After everything that we've been through in the last eight week. It would be so Arsenal to do that. And then your hope goes up again. If we beat Bayern, then I think we'll win the next six games. If we don't, I agree with you, Cooks. Going away to Wolves at half past seven that next Saturday night, I'll be watching it like this. I will be that nervous. We play two games before City play. OK, so we play Saturday and we play Tuesday. City play Wednesday. So we could, in effect, be above them if we beat Wolves and Chelsea. Um, I just listen. All along, I've wanted to win the Champions League. I, 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 I'll be over the bloody moon if we beat Bayern. I know we all will. Um, I just don't know. I just don't know how I feel. I, I just I feel as bad today as I did yesterday, and that's unusual for me. Normally, I'm positive and come on everybody and all that. And I'm just thinking, there's nothing to do with bottle. I just think that one injury to Martinelli. We were four, five, six nils every game because that's what we were doing when he was down the left. You know, Trossard is great as an impact sub. He often scores. But, you know, and but I go back to 89 and exactly what someone just said as well. We then drew to Wimbledon, 2-0. And, and we was all up in arms. And we had to go to Liverpool and win it. Unfortunately, it's not in our hands. We had to go to Liverpool and win it. it it's in City's hands. And that's how I feel. So for the, right? you, I'm still a little bit so negative. For the, so for those of you who had 25 minutes into the podcast before Amanda mentions 1989, uh, congratulations. You are the winners of the Amanda 89. There is Claxton, a reason uh, I week. mentioned it. Some and stage. people mentioned it in the chat room anyway. <laughs> At some stage of every one of the same old article podcast, Amanda will, without fail, mention Anfield 89. Uh, we should probably actually mention... Uh, oh, apparently, uh, I'm just going to say really. something, Chris. Apparently, somebody uh, who is on podcasts actually thinks that I lied and I wasn't there. Found that out as well. Oh, it's all kicking off on the same old Arsenal tonight. Oh, isn't it just? Yeah. Well, you know what? If anyone wants to go and read my blog, let me tell you something. I've written a blog for Dave Seeger's Gunnerstown a long time ago. Um, there's no way I would have known that detail and and written a blog. I promise you I'm not that clever. But it doesn't matter what anyone thinks. I, I don't really care. But I just think it's funny that you mentioned that. But it's true. And the reason I brought it up was because I lost faith then and we lost to um, Derby. Everyone walked out of Highbury in such disgust, a bit like yesterday. Well, we shall see more to left to play out. Um, from my perspective, I do also believe it's probably done, but not because Manchester City won't drop any points. I think they will. I just think it's difficult. And just to, I guess to come back on George' point, James, I, my personal opinion is I think it's quite difficult. It's going to be not impossible, but close to it for us to beat uh, all of the teams. I'm just looking at that game at the scum. Um, and I'm looking at it and thinking, this is that's a sort of game that just feels it's it's got my spider sense tingling. And like you though, I don't believe we can afford to lose any more games. We, we I feel like we always had like one buffer in us that was meant to be Man United away or Spurs away. It wasn't meant to be Villa at home. And so yeah, I I will admit to maybe there was a slight amount of arrogance in my own head because before the game I was like I was saying to the lads in the pub. Um, just do your job, Arsenal. Just do the job now. Let's just get it done. Let's have a boring 2 0 But that is underestimating the opponent that we faced. And they were very, they were good in the second half. You know, Tielemans hit the bar on the post. And then we come to the last few minutes and you've got, um, well, it's defensive shambles, really, wasn't it? Well, talk me through your thoughts. I mean, my thoughts on that first goal, Cookie, 
was where the devil is Alexander Zinchenko playing at right back for Leon Bailey to tap in. But we sort of have, we, we, we know we know all about Zinchenko and what he does. He operates in that more central position, but this just felt like he'd gone walkabout, right? Or was, is that just me? Well, I'm not sure if we're going to do a, a little segment on Zinchenko. And look, I don't want let's to do scapegoat the guy. I, I, I really don't want to be seen as someone that's just laying into him for the sake yeah. of it, because I thought last season, wow, transformative yeah. player, absolutely unreal. This season, at times, yeah. it's just not worked for whatever reason. And if you look at all of the chances Villa had yesterday, that Watkins one in the first half, I mean, you could put some blame at Gabriel as well, but it comes from the ball coming off Zinchenko's back, which then falls into the path of Oli Watkins. The Tielemans one that hits the post is because Zinchenko loses the ball basically in his own area. The one where we concede from uh, Bailey is because Zinchenko... Well, I'm not blaming that entirely on him, but he's entirely out of position. Um I mean, it was catastrophic from him yesterday. And I really like Zinchenko. And I do think he did do some good things in that first half. I mean, he he was the mm. one pinging a couple of lovely balls over to Havertz. But yeah. as a defensive player, against any decent opposition, against any top 10 opposition, I do not trust him. And that's the cut and dry of it for me. I just do not trust him against good opposition. I think we've got to take a real hard look at how we actually use him because He's, he's not a good enough left back, if we're being brutally honest about it. But could there be a solution for him to somehow play in the midfield? Because he's obviously got the technical quality to play higher up the pitch or as part of a midfield trio. And could he do a job in that left eight role? I'm not so sure. But as someone that plays so close to our 18-yard box, he, he cannot be trusted there. Look at some of the things he does. And these are things that you can't coach out of him. And I will never understand Zinchenko's ability or apparent desire to make the simplest of tasks as complicated as they possibly can be. You know, when he's a couple of yards out from his own box and he's trying to think of what elaborate skill he can do to take it past an oncoming attacker, just pass the ball out, man. Like, do the simplest thing. You don't need to do anything crazy. It's not going to get you anywhere. There's no advantage to doing it. That really frustrates me. And I've seen him do that a hell of a lot this season. If he's playing hybrid up the pitch, you know, if he tries that, you know, in the opposition area, fine. It shouldn't really cost us. But the fact he does those things so close to our own box causes us problems. And I, I, I do want to caveat this by saying I love him. I think he's really good when he's on form for us. But I just think at this point in the season, when we're coming up against every single team we've now got to treat basically as an excellent side. I mean, even going to Wolves is a really tough game. There are no easy games left for us this season. I don't trust him against any of the teams that we're going to be playing. I'm really sorry, but I just don't. And at left back, if it's not going to be Kivio, then it has to be Tommy Asu. Yeah. I think one of the challenges we've got, though, and this is why I think he played yesterday, because I th I'm not just not sure how fit Tommy Asu is, and he's just coming back. And I think Kivio was exposed against Bayern. And I think Arteta's always thought of it as almost a break glass in, ter in break glass in case of emergency, the Kivior at left back situation. He did really, really well for a period of weeks. And we all sort of said, brilliant, love it, you know, keep going. But that Bayern one just felt slightly exposed to me. And I think that's probably Arteta as it's probably frightened Arteta a little bit. However, going back to your point just now, and Amanda, just want to get your thoughts on Zinchenko. But actually, also, if you can talk about who you thought was at fault for the first Villa goal, but, for, but on, on Zinchenko, Tomiyasu, or um, Kivior, I just think he's probably got to start looking at Tim, Tomiyasu now from the start, personally, um, because Bayern Munich are going to do exactly. I don't know if Sane is fit or not. I know Komen, he walked off, but. He limped off for the weekend. But if Sane is playing again and Zinchenko is there, they will target him. But Amanda, let's talk about... Give me any thoughts on Zinchenko and then talk about who you thought was at fault for the first goal. Well, I just... If you can see the question, kicking the ball out was a mistake. Why did he oh, do yeah. that? The player was yeah. not head injured. The player was rocking backwards and forwards and acting. And, you wasn't know... Wasn't it two you... Villa players that collided anyway? It wasn't even us that yeah. made the foul. I mean, yeah. look, you know, I understand and he felt under pressure from the Villa players, but our players had a go at him for doing it and Villa players came up and thanked him. Then the bloke runs up, runs out, comes back on. And I think, and, they, and then the worst thing is the whole ground booed Sinchenko for doing it. And, uh, you know, it felt a little bit, look, he isn't everyone's favourite player. I think most people do generally feel the same about him. Um, and if I have to be totally honest, 
I haven't watched any highlights or anything. I don't remember the first or the second goal. All I know is Zinchenko was at fault with one of them. So I can't sit here and say to you who I felt was at fault. If I felt anything, I think the whole team. So I'm sorry, I haven't watched any. I won't watch. I didn't watch it last night. I'm not. I'm not going to watch it back. So I was too upset and too angry. What What I feel is Kivior has to play at Bayern if Tommy is not fit. If he goes with Zinchenko against Bayern, I probably won't watch. I just, I, I couldn't cope with that. Man, Zinchenko uh... and Sane. No, no, no. I, I don't think I could cope. Um, but I'm, I'm sure. Listen, we love Arteta. We're all very much pro Arteta on this podcast um, and I still am I didn't understand yesterday and I have every right to criticise because I don't ever criticise <laughs> I'm always so positive so I started criticising a bit yesterday and I got like loads and loads of people coming at me which I find is strange because I am one of these oh you know one game lost fantastic club it's been brilliant but I you know I pay my money I'm allowed to say what I want and I don't agree with the changes I didn't agree with with the substitutions and I just felt like you need to put ESR on much earlier than he did we needed some creativity and unfortunately the likes of Sinchenko, Jesus and Eddie need to be sold in the summer um, and we need to bring in fresh legs for that um, I just unfortunately and I love Jesus and Sinchenko but I've fallen out of love with that situation and I'm hoping Tommy's fit because we all love Tommy Asso and again we are not a sort of podcast that will go in on any players not one of our players deserved much praise yesterday no James there is a lot to unpick about what Amanda just said there um are you I've got so many questions you can answer any one of these you want are you falling out of love with Zinchenko I mean it, who have actually why don't you talk about the goal because Amanda yeah, obviously said that she doesn't rewatch really it. To no. me, I don't know why Zinchenko is appearing in that right half space. I think the ball across, they all seem to really Watch just it. misread it. Yeah. And then it just, yeah. They yeah, just I mean, it's ball watching, isn't it? The, the goal was coming, though. Before that, there was a period yeah. where didn't Villa have something like four corners in a row or something like that? The goal was definitely coming. Um, and we deserved it at that point in the game because we, we offered nothing. We did not look like scoring whatsoever. And it was just a ball that just rolled across our entire back line. And there's by Bailey completely unmarked to put it in the back of the net. And then shortly after, I mean, you know, if you just want me to get the second goal out of the way as well, it's really poor from Jorginho yeah. who came on just to pass it to the Villa man. Watkins, brilliant run. Last person you want with him is, uh, you know, a pretty limp Smith Rowe. Great finish. Game's done and dusted. And, I'm not sure if we're going to talk about the the big subject, which seems to be on social media today, about fans that were leaving the stadium at 1-0. Um, I'm not saying whether, whether I agree or disagree with that. I mean, everyone has their, you know, their own opinion on that. But I would say, I think the big reason why a lot of people left at 1-0 is because we showed nothing in that second what, half. people left at 1-0? A lot I, of people left really? at one nil. Yeah, a lot. As soon That's as that terrible. ball hit the net, a lot of people left, and I think it was just because that that first half, the second half performance, should I say, was um, was abysmal, and we just never looked like scoring. We never looked like getting into the game, and I think the supporters really felt that, and I think the players looked so deflated after that as well. I do think it is wrong to leave at one nil. I mean, look, at one nil with what was it six minutes left on the clock, eight minutes of injury time, plenty of time to do something in that game still. At 2 0, I mean, it was just an outpour of people leaving from the stadium. And then the game was really done and dusted from there. But yeah, horrible moment, really horrible moment. It, um, it hopefully, let's not let it be season defining. Yeah. Do you know, um, to try and, I guess, understand and explain kind of, I guess, the feelings, like we're all talking about it 20, well, more than 24 hours later about how deflated and de dejected we are. And you're talking about as soon as that second goal goes in, people, me included, are going, well, that's season done because Man City aren't dropping any points and now we've got to go to Bayern Munich and, oh, we've been so good and, oh, it's, it's, it's just so late and, oh, this is happening again. This happened to us last year at April, April time. We ended up doing exactly the same thing. This is just deja vu. This is history repeating itself. So as, a, as an Arsenal fan, all of that stuff is just permeate, permeating around your brain so I will admit to you, at 2-0, I was like, this is done. I'm out of here. So, 
you know, I, I left as soon as that goal hit the net, I was like, I'll see you later, lads. I think I'm I'm done for the day. And it's not because I'm a plastic fan or because, you know, I walk out early or all of that sort of stuff. It's because of all of those emotions that are going on. You know, that's that's how I felt. That's what I did. You know, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just how you feel in the moment. So I don't know. Um, Amanda, we've only got you for two more minutes. So yeah, um, do you I've want to uh, kind of give some but thoughts will, on that? I will say something. Football is a funny old game. And although we're deflated and I do feel like City are going to win it now. Um, the weird thing is, because Villa are fourth, City have got to go to Tottenham. And generally, Tottenham do okay against City. So the weirdest thing is they need to fight for fourth. But their fans aren't going to want that because their fans will not want us winning the league much more than them getting fourth. I can 100% guarantee that. So although I still feel City are going to win this and I'm like that, I it may come a point where if we do beat Wolves and if we do beat Chelsea and we are top, and obviously they're going to have um, a game in hand or whatever it is, two games. It, it is down to them to win, and I get that. I just, I do feel deflated. I do feel disappointed. Um, it's not like last season. Last season we had injury after injury. Um, I, I just feel sad because I feel the team have just been phenomenal this season. I've loved it, and I'd hate that we just sort of gave up now. I want us to fight in Allianz when the, our fans are going to be incredible out there and our fans will be brilliant at Wolves on Saturday evening as well. Um, I'm just disappointed. That's all. Disappointed because we're so good. On our day, we're just so good and we will we would beat anyone. City have not beaten us this season and that says a lot. Mm. And we've just... All of the pools. Yeah, and I just feel like... In the league. Look, it, it, what are they? One or two points ahead of us? I don't even know. Two. Two and Two Liverpool points. one behind us, yeah. So no, we're the same, no level. Oh, we oh, of course we are. We're level, aren't we? So it is still very close. And I get what you're saying, Cooks. If we were five points behind, then they lost, and all of a sudden now we're two be points behind City, we'd be all buzzing, wouldn't we? Now, like, but it, it's just, I just think the last few games we haven't played how we've been playing, and that's my concern. And on that note, I do have to leave you all. Um, but just before you go, been though, do you want to do a prediction for Bayern? Do you do a prediction for Bayern before you go? Okay. I will take what happened against Porto. I'll take one all and penalties right now. Uh, that's what I'm going to go for, okay? No, I'm going to go two all yeah, and penalties. Right. What are you going to go for? Because I've got to write it down. And then we'll uh, win on penalties. I think we're going <laughs> to lose 2-1 against Bayern. I'll explain my workings in a minute. Um, cookie? Cooks? I think we're going to win 2-0. Oh, so two new and so your zero T. Right, lovely. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for everyone in the chat room. Yes, I'm not a plastic fan. Ooh. I've got to go. <laughs> All right, Bye, everyone. See I'll you see soon. See you later, Amanda. Always. Bye. Kyle, just before the All end, right. there. love that. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I think I think she very was, harsh uh, on you, Chris. I thought she wasn't sure whether or not she would. I, I wasn't sure if she wanted me to cut her out or remove her or not. But uh, she's in the. She's in the back room. She's just nodding. I think we're all right. Um, right. So let's talk about Bayern and then we'll talk about Wolves. Um, mate, my challenge here is that I always look to the glass half empty, particularly after a, a situation like the weekend. And I just feel like I feel like we're going to play well. I do believe we're going to play well. But you saw how potent Bayern were with the two chances that they had to go 2-1 up. And I just fear we're going to get some more of that. We're going to get Bayern trying to go direct. We're going to get Bayern trying to target our left-hand side. And unless we fix up, look sharp, I just worry that we're going to get countered on. But I guess the other the, the counter to that, the counter to my counter, is that Bayern won't play as defensively at home, will they? They just set out to basically frustrate and then hit us on transition. I can't see them doing that at home. What do you reckon? Yeah, I agree. I don't think that they're going to, you know, play at 10 yards close to their goal. I definitely think they're going to push up, try and take the impetus and, and see us off. But I think that will kind of play into our hands. I think we just need to revert into boring, boring Arsenal for a big portion of this game. Just sit in, soak up the pressure and catch them on the counter if we can do that. That's where 
the potential problem could be because I don't actually think we're the best counter-attacking team in the world. And I think this is going to be really important in terms of the team lineup. He's got to get that spot on. If he doesn't get that right, uh, I think that could have serious repercussions. Um, but this is a really good opportunity for us. And I, uh, the reason I'm predicting 2-0 is because I just have this very strange memory of when we went to the Allianz and won 2-0 when we'd lost 3-1 at home. And this was back when the away goals rule was a thing. So we still ended up going out of the competition. But if we can go there with Jovino and Carl Jenkinson in the team, then I think we we stand a decent enough <laughs> chance of going up against this Bayern Munich side that are going to have Eric Dyer in the back four. Look, we just got to put yesterday to the back of our minds because it's not like we played badly against Bayern Munich either. I mean, as someone says in the chat box, they've got no Komen, they've got no Nabry, they've got no Davies. These are big players for them. You know, they're going to have a 34-year-old Thomas Gnabry Wilson. definitely confirmed to be out? Nabry is out. Is he's, got a, he's got, to he's got a hamstring injury. So if we don't take advantage of that, I'll be really disappointed because um, they're going to have a 34-year-old Thomas Muller starting who, don't get me wrong, is still a very good player and he's caused us many a nightmare over the years. But I would argue that on paper, we've got the stronger team going into that game. It's just going to be that atmosphere... It's going to be a daunting prospect going to the Allianz. We all know why that is. We've gone there and had some absolutely horrendous defeats. But we're not going there with Coquelin, Mustafi, um, Bellerin. We're going there with a very strong Arsenal team. But we can't let yesterday play into our minds. Because like I said earlier, if we... Well, we've lost yesterday. If we lose this one as well, dread to think what the repercussions will be. I have, I have that fear as well. Like, if you... There's part of me that was like, if we get knocked out of the Champions League, it might not be the worst thing in the world because then you've got to focus on the Premier League. But then there's the psychological damage that that might do. And I think that it feels like that could be irreparable. Um, it's not, it, you know, you then go, even if we lose against Bayern, if you then go and beat Wolves, no matter how scrappy it is, you're thinking to yourself, right, well, your focus is there now, just as you said, go and win all of those games, no excuses. But I just wonder about that psychological impact. That's the concern that I have so what's your team then because you mentioned a minute ago about he's got to get the, the the team right against Bayern so what would you do as your lineup so I would go with pretty much the the back four that we know it's going to be David Rayer in goal White Saliba Gabriel and then I'd look to bring Tommy Yasu in then in midfield I would look to reintroduce Thomas Partey alongside Declan Rice and I'd say alongside I would prefer them to play as more of a pivot rather than one playing as an eight and one playing as a six. So them two alongside each other, Martin Erdegaard kind of in the Mesa Ozil role, the number 10, and then a front three of Jesus, Havertz and Bakayo Saka. And I think there's a few ones that are up for debate there. Jorginho for Partey. If I see that in the starting lineup, I'm not going to be disappointed. I think, you know, there's every case to start that, but I really want some power, muscle, and someone to help out a Declan Rice that I think is running on his last power cell at the minute. So I think bringing in Thomas Partey, you know, he didn't play any minutes against Aston Villa. He had a good half against Luton, then he started to fade away. But I think now is the time where you bring him into the starting eleven. I think he's been in and around the team long enough to start this game. We need some muscle in that midfield for sure. Then Jesus on the left, I thought he was disappointing against Villa. I thought he had some good moments, but he was offside constantly. I thought it was quite telling when he went for a um, a loose ball and came up against uh, Diego for them, who I thought was excellent. And he just looked so far off the pace. He just that that you know pace he had across five ten yards looks to have completely gone. But I still think on the wing he can offer something for us. So I think out of him and Martinelli, he's the one that's been. Well, he's been in the team more recently. So I think I'd start with him. But again, he's another one that if Martinelli starts, no issues there. But he wasn't in the game against Villa, if we're being honest. Martinelli just wasn't involved at all. And he's not really been involved yeah. since he's come back from this injury. So I've got question marks in my head about him. I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm in this worrying phase where I, I don't fully trust some of the players that I'm putting in that starting eleven, Like, I don't know how Party's going to play. I don't know how Jesus is going to play. Yeah, Phil Matt um, just said that in the chat. Like, how fit is he going to be as well? Party. Yeah, I mean, that's the worry, isn't it? But he's been training for so long around the team. He started the game against Luton. He came on against City for half an hour. You know, if, if we're not going to use him now, when are we going to use him? We waited so long for this guy to be fit. He's more than likely gone in two months' time. Like, for God's sake... Let's just use him whilst we've got him. He's he, On his day, he's a world-class footballer. And this is a Champions League game that I think he is made for. 
And I want to see that midfield free of Rice, Odegaard and Thomas Partey at least once before Partey leaves in the summer. Yeah. I'm playing you know, that as if it's an edit, but it might normally, not be. Yeah. I would normally agree with you, but it's just the fitness thing. Because like Thomas Partey, when we've watched him in recent games, he looks like he's running through treacle. And and Gabriel Jesus looks a bit like that at the weekend. Um which is odd because he only played 20 minutes against Bayern. So uh, I didn't think Gabriel Jesus looked too nippy and sprightly. And as uh, was it? I think it was, um, yeah, I think it was, was it, it was Melissa or Karen that said that, that, yeah, Melissa said that knee injury has wrecked him. It does, he doesn't look like the same player, but um, would you go for Jorginho? Because um, Gentiles just said in the uh, chat, if party's not doing it, do you, do you go for Jorginho? So if he, if Arteta decides that he's not fully fit, would you be happy playing Jorginho or would you want to do something different in the, almost the midfield three? I think you'd have to play Jorginho. For me, it's either Jorginho or Partey. Whatever one of those starts, yeah. I will be happy with, so long as the other two start in a Rice and Martin Edegaard, which we know they will be. Yeah. I don't trust anyone else to play in that left eight role, if that's how we're going to line up. I don't trust... Kai Habits in there enough. I don't think he's good enough in there. I think he, and it's, it's more that he's better as a centre forward now. So I want him to carry on playing in that position. Do I trust Emil Smith Rowe there based on what I saw yesterday? Not really. And, and is he going to realistically start a Champions League final at the Allianz? No, he's not. And then you've got Leandro Trossard who could play in that left eight role. He's not played there in ages. Fabio Vieira, has he even kicked the ball since he's come back from injury? You know, barely. So. It's got to be one of Jorginho or Partey. I think Arteta will probably pick Jorginho, and I've got no problem with that, really, so long as he puts in the levels that he has done recently. But I think it's quite noticeable that Jorginho is another one that's starting to run out of gas. I'm not sure if you've noticed around the 55, 60 minute mark, he, he tends to take yeah. on these like gels or whatever it is to keep his fitness going. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, you start um, Jorginho, Rice, and Erdogan, and they play as they have been over the past couple of months. And then around the 60-minute mark, you make that change, take off Jorginho for Thomas Partey. But if we're looking back to the game against City, where we started Jorginho, he was ineffective in that game, really. I mean, he wasn't bad, but he wasn't able to play his game because we didn't have the ball. I think it's going to be very similar on Wednesday night. And for that reason, that's why I would start Thomas Partey. Hmm. Yeah, it's a really, really tough one to call. And as you said, when we started talking about this, he's got to get it right. But I don't know what the right answer is right now. Like we've got people talking about when's um, Timber going to be. I think Karen says one of the questions, you know, what are we going to see Timber again this season? I mean, I don't think that he'll be any, because the games are so high octane and they, they are, they mean so much because of where we are. I just don't think he gets risks. So I doubt we'll see anything of Timber, if yeah, not just I, the odd sort of substitute appearance. I, I don't think we'll see Timber this season, to be quite honest with you. I mean, there was a there's an Arsenal under-21s game going on now, and he's not part of that squad. And I think if we were going to see him anytime soon, he'd have to be part of that. And if he's not deemed ready for that, and he's been, what, training for a month now with the first team, pretty much, mm. I think Arsenal are probably going to look at it now and say, we, we just want to get him ready for next season. So I think you're probably looking yeah. at, a 10 minute cameo against Everton on the last day of the season. And that'll probably be it. I don't think he's going to play any significant role and you can't expect him to when he's just coming back from an injury like no. this. So I wouldn't be you know, banking on him, um, but it, it will just be good to see him back hopefully when he is available. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We've got uh, just a few more minutes left. We'll do another sort of five minutes or so. So we'll get through a few questions. Just again, just as I said, right at the beginning at the top of the show, um, if you uh, can hit the like, subscribe, all of that sort of stuff, that'd be great. But this podcast is sponsored by the fabulous Ruth Beck Art. Ruth sends us um, always some quite interesting stuff uh, that she's working on. She does a lot of interesting stuff around the North London forever. I've seen uh, the different types of artworks. She's got great pin badges. I'm just showing some of the pin badges up on screen there for the west stand for the east stand um you know she's got a lot of great stuff that she does uh check her out on etsy go to ruth beck art and uh yeah uh do some purchases because uh always there's always somebody in there's an, always an arsenal fan in your life that you love enough to be able to send some of that stuff through but james shall we get to some questions yes please mate yes please Let's start with uh, Phil who said, we are, are we so disappointed because Arteta has made us so good that it's come as a complete shock? I think this sort of is similar to what you were saying when you were doing your hyper 
hypothetical alternate world where we win at the weekend and Man City lose. It's all about narrative, isn't it? Like, and, and the narrative and the feeling right now is based off of the motions of a defeat. Whereas last week, the narrative and the feelings was we've just beaten Thr- Brighton three 0 away. We could win every single game for the rest of the season and be champions. Yeah, I think the disappointment for me is because it's the team ahead of us that I just feel are so relentless. And I think a lot of people share that sentiment as well. It's not because obviously losing yesterday was bad, but it's because of who we're competing with to win this league. I think we can all, you know, potentially say that Liverpool might drop a few more points between now and the end of the season. The worry for me has always been City more than Liverpool. I think Liverpool have done brilliantly this season with the injuries they've had. But I think if you're looking for a team that's just relentless and will grind out results and go about their business and go under the radar by doing it is Manchester City. I mean, they could win back-to-back trebles and no one's even talking about that being a prospect because it's just such a, it just feels like it could just be such a, an inevitability. So I um, am more disappointed that we've dropped drop points and we're now behind City. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, we've been so good this 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 year. I mean, I think the the real failure for us is getting zero points from Aston Villa and one point from Fulham and then even losing that game yeah. to West Ham. You can have one blip, but there's quite a few that we've had in there. Um, and as good as 2024 has been, some bad results in the first half of the season, even losing at Newcastle away, we shouldn't have lost that game. I mean, things went against us in that match, but um, as good as we've been, we have made mistakes along the way. That shouldn't be forgotten. But uh, like I said earlier, it's crazy that we've won this many games this season. We've drawn one. And because of one loss, we're talking about our title challenge hanging by a thread. That's just how good City are. And like Arteta said, if we were in any other league, we'd probably be a couple of points clear. But we're not. We're up against City. Yeah, yeah I think the psychology at this stage of the season is massive. Like, you know, earlier on in the season, like that Newcastle game, imagine we, uh, you know, hypothetical world, we just get out of there playing terrible or not not really creating much, but we don't concede that ghost goal that should never have been given it's nil nil and then even you take the Fulham game just just or, or one of the Fulham or West Ham games imagine if we'd have just drawn just one of those games we'd be level on points with them right now and we'd be saying well it was a mistake but do you know what we're still top on goal difference and you know it's it's those little tiny margins for, for error that at the time don't feel like they're they're, they're season defining but when you're up against a nearly perfect side like City, you know, as you said, it's there isn't any margin for error. And let's talk about psychology actually a little bit, because an interesting question from Gentile here, which is, um, can we use the humbling to our advantage as we're not completely out of it? Declan Rice, I think, said something like this afterwards. He said that, you know, we need to use this um, as a as a motivator. Do you think that is, is that one of the reasons why you have this sort of weird positive feeling about the Bayern one because this Arsenal team it, it does eventually react well to shock results like you just look at Fulham and West Ham and all right we lost to Liverpool but we smashed Liverpool and we, they just counter-attacked us and then we went on that amazing run so from a psychological perspective do you what do you think about uh, Gentile's question using the defeat to Villa to then go and make some history well it can go one of two ways as we've been alluding to in this podcast it, it could either go really well or it could go really badly we've just got to ensure that we don't let it go really badly and as i was saying earlier we just need to give ourselves a bit of a kick up the backside and remember exactly who we are because it was only last week that we were so good against brighton we've been so good all year round you can't let one bad result you know tarnish everything you can't let it be season defining because that then tells me that this is a mental thing because okay we're looking a bit tired, but we've got all of our players fit. You know, we've got an excellent manager who who admittedly made a few mistakes yesterday, but you don't chuck all your toys out of the pram because of one bad result. So I really hope the team reacts and we see a different Arsenal on Wednesday. I mean, if we put in that first half performance that we put in yesterday across both halves, I'd still fancy us to win the game. So we can't be too down and out about it. So yeah, even in, you know, some really dire times supporting Arsenal, when it looks like we're never going to pull a result out of the hat. Sometimes we do. And the one I'd always go back to, which is a completely different era of Arsenal, but when we were fighting for top four with Spurs, we were so far behind them in the Premier League um, in the 2011-12 season. And then out of nowhere, we go 2-0 down at the Emirates, come back to win that game 5-2. It's just when you don't think it's going to happen, it does happen with Arsenal. That's the best way to look at it. But this is a massive game against a very, very, very tough opponent who 
have nothing left to play for this season. They're out of the Bundesliga. That's done and dusted. Their season rides on this game. It's not quite the same for us, but it's still very, very important for us. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, I'm going to answer one quick question from Karen, which was, do you think it was a mistake not to sign an out-and-out striker in January? Uh, no, I don't, actually. I mean, we're lamenting that now, but let's just remind ourselves that by way of a slight bit of positivity. You know, we've got 75 goals that we've scored this season. Man City have only just overtaken us, having scored five against Luton at the weekend. We were the top goal scorers in the league with the best defence by quite some distance. So, no, I don't think it has... The out and out. I do think it's something we need to address in the summer. I don't think it's something that is impacting us right now. Uh, quick one from Wookie Cookie. Uh, if we go through, is that a cousin of yours? Is it? Um, uh, if we go through uh, Madrid or City, who do you want? Madrid. From one cookie 100%. to another. Madrid. Uh, I think that's a fairly standard question. I do wonder again, going back to the psychology, what that would do to us if we beat. Um, Bayern and then have to play City again twice. Oh, I can't, sort of I can't, we don't have I can't to deal with season. that. And it's just, I don't want to have to go up against them again. Just get me a trip to Madrid, please. Uh, that's what I'd, uh, that's what I love. Um, question Could Kane have been, should Kane have been seen red for the elbow on Gabriel? I'm going to answer that quickly. I think yes, I think we all know that. And uh, yeah, he gets away with it, which is uh, interesting. And one of the things which, again, Arteta was questioned on in his press conference yesterday because Erdegaard came off and he was asked why that was and he said he felt something. So Phil says in the chat, uh, do we stand a chance if Herb Garden or Erdegaard, Erdegaard uh, doesn't play on Wednesday? What do you think, James? No, to be quite honest with you. I think it's very unlikely that we'll get a positive result if he doesn't play. I think he'll be fine. I think it's very unlikely that he's picked up an injury. But... Um, yeah, I mean, who who's the natural replacement? Fabio Vieira or Smith Rowe? Oh, do, do I trust either of them going to the Allianz and starting the game? I'd love to say yes, but I'm not convinced by either of them at the minute. And I love Smith yeah. Rowe, but I thought he was really tame when he came on yesterday. I wouldn't trust him in such a massive fixture against such a big opponent. So that would be a massive loss for us if we lost our captain. Yeah, it really, really would. Let's keep all of our fingers crossed that we have not lost him. And I'm with you. I think on the substitutions yesterday, just as we're rounding up today's blog, blog pod, uh, getting myself into tomorrow morning's uh, tomorrow morning's activities mode. But um, just as we round up today, I think the substitutions, it just didn't really work. Martinelli didn't really work. Jorginho, as you said, poor for their second goal that we conceded. Um, and Smith Rowe really offered very, very little. Um, and one of the things that we have said has got better about Arteta, particularly at times this season in the second half, some of the, sometimes the substitutions have made a difference. You know, we saw that against Bayern. The substitutions that he made by bringing on Zinchenko, by bringing on Gabriel Jesus, they made a difference. So hopefully this was a blip. Um, I'm hoping that those of you who have joined us today for the whole of the duration of the pod, thank you very much, as always. Um, please subscribe, like, um, hit the little bell on the, I think you're on, if you're on YouTube, it's a little bell notifications and you'll get uh, an update whenever we're going live. Um, James, we need to wrap up today. Uh, I think we might do a post Bayern pre Wolves thing, but uh, that'll be in your the ball will be in your court as the master of the preview stuff. So uh, we'll talk, talk amongst ourselves and go from there. But any final things you want to bring up before we get out of it today? No, I would just say you know it's hard to be positive after a result like that, but season is still very much alive. I think it'd be stupid to think that it's it's totally done, but. A win on Wednesday changes everything. So let's hope for it. Let's hope for it. Um, once again, thanks from myself, from Cookie and from uh, the departed, now departed Amanda, but we'll be back soon enough. But uh, keep it Arsenal. Keep the faith. Uh, season's not over. More to do on Wednesday. So let's keep our fingers crossed for then. See you later, guys. Mm -hmm.